I can sum up. We'll meet again. Don't know where. Don't know where. <laughs> Some sunny day at a cookout. So again, thank you for being here on our as part of our programming for our 30th anniversary. I think um, we are the oldest secular humanist group in in the city and in this in greater Cincinnati. Maybe even this whole area. I'm not sure. So the subtitle of Robin D'Angelo's best-selling book, White Fragility, is Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. At the uh, quite light-complected Free Inquiry group, we've been trying to arrange tonight's talk for a year. Initially, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, renewed civil unrest in Cincinnati, and renewed attention focusing on Cincinnati's collaborative agreement repeatedly being cited as a model by and for other cities and their police departments. In the interim, one presentation we did have was about the pseudo-scientific justifications for racism. It was a very interesting presentation. Some years earlier, Dig also had a presentation by local representatives of the Black Lives Matter movement, which arose in response to the acquittal of the police officer who shot and killed Florida teenager Trayvon Martin in 2012, and then grew nationally following the police killings of Michael Brown in Missouri and Eric Garner in New York City, or New York, I think it was New York City. We also have had a presentation by local civil liberties attorney, Pat Gerhardt State, <laughs> <laughs> uh, discussing, uh, among other things, the collaborative agreement that he and our, our presenter tonight worked on. Hopefully sometime we'll schedule a program addressing why local secular humanist groups attract so few people of color. Perhaps while we're still celebrating our 30th anniversary. But tonight we're focused on Cincinnati's issues of racism, policing, the collaborative agreement and its refresh and underlying yet unresolved issues. In 2000, tonight's speaker co-founded Cincinnati's Black United Front in response to the deaths of 14 African-American men at the hands of police the preceding five years, and in particular, an event known as 2 in 24, where two African-American men were killed by Cincinnati police in one 24-hour period. The front joined with Gerhard Stein and the ACLU to file a class action lawsuit against the city, its police department, and the fraternal order of police, alleging systemic racism and racial profiling going back decades. Before anything could be resolved, however, Cincinnati police shot and killed Timothy Thomas, an unarmed African-American teenager, wanted for numerous warrants, mostly traffic violations and all misdemeanors, following which renewed civil unrest erupted in the downtown, especially over the Rhine neighborhood in which Thomas was killed. Eventually, a federal district court judge compelled the city to reach a historic collaborative agreement with the ACLU the Black United Front and the Department of Justice and establish a citizen complaint authority. In 2018, a refresh of the agreement was undertaken, uh, which is one of the things we're going to hear about tonight. Irish Shows Rowley, that's with the hyphen there, has been passionately involved in these issues for decades and has been the most active and visible identity for the Cincinnati Black United Front and the African American community generally in relation to systemic racism in the CPD and its underlying issues and causes. She was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, is the mother of three, the grandmother of five, is that still true? Uh, That's what makes me old. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> That's an inside joke, sorry. Okay. Oh. <laughs> but it's not an outside joke. <laughs> And the wife, 30 plus years? No, 27. We celebrated 27. We've been together 30 years. I thought you were much older. Yes. Oh, here we go. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. oh, oh. oh, oh. I offered to help you get him out of the department. Sit down. Sit down. I'm going to get all the way. To Jesse Rowley. He's coming, by the way. He was coming. He was just contacted by uh, electronic telecommunication means. and. He's on his way. Her own activist activism was shaped by her grandmother, Vivian Kinnebrew, 
He was a nurse and a social activist, not only in Cincinnati, but around the country. Iris also serves on the board of the Cincinnati Human Rights Commission and the Police Chief Advisory Board, just to name two of such boards, uh, that the latter one selects the city's police chief, which resulted in Cincinnati's first African-American cop cop in 2011 and others since. And at, oh, this is the one fact I'm not sure of. At almost the same time as the founding of Cincinnati Black United Front, Iris and Jesse established Rocho Awards and Graphics in Bond Hill, Absolutely. The, the only Black-owned engraving company in the region, providing promotional items, awards, trophies, plaques, custom apparel, and signage. So when you need some things like that, you know where to go now. Yeah. As one article I read says, that business is her livelihood, but the pursuit of racial justice is Iris Rowley's life work. So it's indeed an honor to welcome to big Iris Rowley. Always introduce people who may not remember, and, and those who know something about it but have forgotten. This four year old in Urban Second Book on the city of Cincinnati. Excuse me, I'm having trouble hearing. Yes, I'm sorry, this is, I'm going to show you this clip. Does it have its own sound? Yeah, you need to unmute.
what can't get to him. So, or no? Do I leave Zoom now? You're, you're fine with it. You could stop your video if you like. <laughs> Thank you all for taking that time back in um, our, our time around what happened Where is she? in the city of Cincinnati. Um, my name is Iris Rowe. And thank you for that very concise bio. So that um, <laughs> I'm assuming she means that. I do mean that. Um, every time I watch that video, I am un unnerved and unmoved. And let me just tell you why before I go into the presentation. My business sits two blocks from where Roger owns. And what they didn't tell you about the two and 24, because most people believe that the Cincinnati Black United Front and the ACLU started this journey after Timothy Thomas. It was those two individuals, Roger Owens Jr. and Jeffrey Hines, and for significant reasons, and I want you to hear them. Jeffrey Irons was a black man who suffered from mental health issues. 20 years later, this is all we hear about, right? Mental health and policing. He was a black man that stole something from an IGA store and ran, and the police chased him, found him under a car, and shot him. Within the same 24 hours, this is November 6th, in the same 24 hours, Roger Owens Jr., who was home for six months from his second tour for duty to visit his parents who, was, who were taking care of his daughter. He was the sole custodian of his daughter. And he walked to the Coney Head, that is two blocks away from my business, to buy some items. And the things that black people have been playing with by the police, the people that they pay to protect and serve them, was that you look like someone who had committed Roger Owens B. Jr. was never portrayed in the media as a veteran, never as a father, a son, a brother, a citizen who deserved that. So that's why that particular piece, when you see the Owens Bs who have since moved in from the city of Cincinnati, who could not rest in the city of Cincinnati because their son, who had given his life and his service, to this country, his murder. Did they shoot him because they thought it was someone else? They didn't shoot him, he died by a oh. Oh. But why did they stop him? They thought he was someone else. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. They thought he was someone else. And it wasn't just CPD that was on the scene. We sit, my business sits on the corner of Langdon Farm and Weeby. We are surrounded by five police municipalities. So it was Norwood who was on the chair, Columbia Township. Uh, I think Silverton used to have its own police department before the sheriff took over. So all these people came. The problem is, is that all the people who watched it and lived in the community that nobody gave a damn about. Let me thank Faye for having me. This guy harassed my email. <laughs> um, I've been extremely busy since the Brianna Taylor and George Floyd's murder, which is unfortunate. We shouldn't have to 
people murdered by the police in such a way that we've watched in these last couple of years. I didn't think it could get any worse than Tamir Rice, which is right up the street from us. I didn't think it was any could be any worse than Michael Carpenter, who was one of ours, our 14 that we talked about. I didn't think it could get any worse than that. But then you see Breonna Taylor in her bed, not bothering anyone, shot to death. Then we all watched George Floyd. And by the way, we spent our 27th wedding anniversary in Minneapolis, which is that back, and helping the community construct what they want to see their police to be with the Department of Justice. They finally have a facility after 25 years of begging. And I was say, after being in Minneapolis and listening to the stories and looking at the media because the police were still doing very bad things, I needed to hurry up and get home. You never appreciate what you've gotten to go someplace else. So you all think, or anyone that you know, believes that Cincinnati isn't on the verge of something better. Look around. When you can look down the highway to Wolver, and some of the municipalities don't have body worn cameras. We've had body worn cameras since 2016, 15, before that. We've had dash cameras in front of the cars. The police tools, the tool of accountability that we have given police has been ginormous. But they also cost the budget and they cost taxpayers. The people who are on the front end of the abuse have to pay on the back end. Cincinnati is a not an insured city. So when somebody sues, they get them. My tax dollar goes into that settlement. So it is important for us to begin to look at how police are constructed and the powers that we give them. Police reform doesn't just stop with them, it starts with us as well. You only can see, and I'm quite sure you got little ones in your family who show you social media stuff. My four year old grand granddaughter just called me on FaceTime with over her eyes. What did I do? She called me on FaceTime and I answered, and she was like, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I did. But anyway, we all have young ones, and we know of some young minds who are watching police interactions that are extremely negative and volatile. And they create the opportunity of not wanting to engage and having a very bad attitude. You, you just can't have it both ways. You can't tell me that I need to respect you when I'm asking you doing it, beating me down, and people who look like me. You can't expect for me to support you and not say be fine. Not that that's my position, but I understand. This, this time, gentleman asked me today, and I know I'm off script, and I'm going to give you. What are some of the questions that people don't ask you? They never ask me the impact of police on my own family. My black older, my natural hair, my black husband, and three black sons. I'm extremely active in this particular area. It makes me enemy number one. And I'm a girl. <coughs> yes. Perfect point. Sure. You mentioned uh, in 1995 that was that the year that the mentally ill black man was. Uh, Jeffrey Irish was 2001. Okay. There was one guy in 1995 mm -hmm. who, who was mentally ill. Lorenzo Collins. Um, and, and that was the, I, I remember that. That was the one where um, the police removed several minutes of the videotape. There was a there was a there was a tape of them of the encounter with him, and they removed several minutes of it. The reason I mention that is I'm interested that since 2016, when they've got the dash cams and the body cams, have there been any incidents where um, somebody in the police department claims that that the, the cams didn't work, or are they picking up all the interactions? We've been through that um, uh -huh. with the amount of time that the body cams can actually record versus the length of time that an officer is on duty. But there haven't been any suspicious... Not that I've heard about. Okay, well that's... that's but now we have this technology, which... Uh -huh. The more technology needs more money. And so it they're, means, not, they're not being complicit, at least, for the claim that... The, the, I don't, 
So I don't know. I'm not giving well, you a guess. I remember guessing. 95 yeah. for sure. It was, there was definitely three or four minutes missing. That's when they were attacking. Absolutely. Let yeah. me give you what we do now. What, and I say we because I pay for it. What is now being done in the city of Cincinnati? Anytime you deploy your gun or your taser, it is automatically recorded by Bluetooth. And it goes into a car. So you can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. I see. Not that we've had significant amounts of uh, complaints, but there were some times where officers was, I forgot to turn it on. And very critical incidents. Yes. Okay. That's yes. very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Did I answer you? You answered it. I understand. I think okay. I understand a lot. Yeah. It's very critical. Absolutely. So that's what we have currently. But again, that's an additional million dollars on the budget on top of a budget. The million dollars could be spent on other things that we need to have, like mental health, social workers. So a lot of mental health um, that needs to be addressed. And because we can't pick the phone and call the mental health people to come and help, we dial 911. So we have to figure out, and that's what we're in the beginning stages of trying to do is figuring out how to respond to the, to the calls for service. And then black people don't want to call 911, and we do call, we, we, we use it the most, but we become the issue when we down 911. I'm saying is that. That is why we have the citizens complaining for it. But let me get back to this. And my sister just threw me off with that question, and now I'm gonna have to go look up and make sure we don't, what's that mean, no signal? that we don't have. Did you have to hit function F10 to start the video? No, I didn't, I just hit enter. Um, so function F10? Sometimes, no. sometimes. Here we go, we just went down. Sorry. Should I be on the lookout for Jesse? <laughs> don't call me if you can't find me. That's what happens when you're open. <laughs> Make sure I'm not lost. <laughs> so in the year of 2000, we actually, the Cincinnati Black and United Front sprung into action because 14 of our downtown restaurants decided to close during one of the largest revenue generating events. And it just happens to be the one that's geared toward Black people. The music festival it used to be the cool jazz festival. Now I'm really old. <laughs> Macy's jazz festival, you know, now it's Parker and Gamble's jazz festival. But black people bring into the city, last time we had it two years ago, $110 million in two days. We're not going to even add the $1.5 million in, in parking. And we don't know how much Newport and Covington got because some people spend the night over here. 90 million went to hotels, you know, the rest went to food, clothing, you know, and alcohol. Well, in the year of 2000, when the 14 that downtown restaurants decided to close, and they did it with the help of Archie, they wrote a letter and they said, black people are coming to Cincinnati, and guess what? They don't know how to order food, they don't know how to tip, they don't know how to act. So we are going to shut our doors. 14 of them collectively say, wrote a letter, and they were supported. Well, we sprung into action because those 14 downtown restaurants had gotten what? Our tips, our tax dollars for furniture, fixtures, facades, to buy buildings, to, to do things, to buy equipment, except the outside. And we thought, how dare you not know how to speak the language of the people who are coming into the city? Of course, there's some ordinance that says you cannot shut your doors to people. You just cannot do it. So we sprang into action in the summer of 2000. And then in the fall is when we had the two and 24, Jeffrey Honors and Roger Lansby Jr. Now, it was just not the Cincinnati Black United Front, because there were five different other civil rights organizations that were out there. Some had already been out there. Some were just coming up when we did. Because those two and 24 seemed to have really hit home in the Black community. Because the Black community was tired of hearing the same things 
he had heard it twice in 24 hours, that these killings, these murders, these shootings were justified. Okay, so how do you know that? Was there an investigation? Did anybody look into it? Did we reenact the scene? Were there witnesses? And then why were they murdered? The 14 that the 14 that you described, I think the most egregious was Michael Harvey, who needed a dime, who was buying a bottle of oil in a corner store. I think it was a king cook. And the guy said, You need a dime. And instead of him saying, here's the bottle of oil, I'll put the dime in it, he goes to his car to try to find a, a, a dime. Comes back, found the dime, piece of oil, leaves. Officer comes and all hell breaks. So he's in his car. The black community and the trauma that has been imposed upon us for decades by the people who are supposed to protect and serve us is tremendous. A collateral damage is huge. It's almost undoable. So the only thing that we thought that we could do was fight back. How do we do that? Well, we are meeting. There's a community that we want you Black United Fronters to go figure it out. So we're meeting at 1829 Elm Street at New Prospect Baptist Church every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. And these two white guys used to show up to our meetings with these big old binders saying we want to help. And we would say we don't want your help. We need the lens of response to reflect the lens of the people who are being traumatized, killed, murdered, and all this mayhem in the streets. And I think for about three weeks they would come. Big binders and talk. We need you, and you won't need us. Finally, somebody said, hey, people, let's hear what they have to say. Right? We're talking about the city of Cincinnati. One of the two guys was Al Garrison, just one of my dearest friends in the entire world. Civil rights attorney in the city of Cincinnati, the baddest in the country, if you ask me. And the other was Scott Greenwood. The other was who? Scott, Scott Greenwood. Greenwood. Oh, man. ACLU. ACLU, <coughs> attorney at the time. Al Gerhardstein came to us with a 33-year history of police abuse in the black community. In these binders. He had tracked it from 1967 to the year of 2000. The things that he had uncovered, the systematic abuse, the way that the system allowed its workers to not only abuse people on the outside, but on the inside too. So you know, if black people were having their heart on the outside, imagine what they were having on the inside. So we finally said, that's why you have two associates, that's why you have the, the the union, the FOP union, and the Sentinel organization. Because black officers felt as though they could not get, and they still feel this way, representation by the union that is set to protect and serve them internally. So with that, we decided these guys might be, might be on to something. We might need to listen to them. But we needed one more term. We needed the litigator. And we definitely, and definitely needed someone who looked like us. Because we ate our hell in the beginning. Trust was not an option. We needed results right now. So then Ken Lawson joined us. Ken Lawson was the baddest litigator. We called him the law dog. He was on Black Talk Radio. He was selling everybody from here to hell. He had more clients than you could imagine. The kid had his own shared issues. I just recently spoke to Ken by way of Zoom because the Micronesian people in Hawaii are having a horrible time with the police and he's asking us to come and assist them in Hawaii <laughs> to do the work. Oh, did I lose it again talking? Why y'all let me do that? 
right. So if you um, if you play the slideshow too, it'll be larger on the screen. Is that what it is? I well, I think it's because you're not plugged in. You're, I'm not. It you keeps going to, to sleep. How do I play it? What's that mean? Uh, the, down to the bottom right hand corner is a little yeah. screen. Yeah. Oh, okay. All the way up. Okay. Right there. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I really like having conversation because um, just talking about the work, it, because the work is tedious. The work is about ensuring that the, the details match the head. So when people hear reform, they go, oh, yeah, it's going to get done. How and who is going to do that? Right? <laughs> That's the work. We spent our, our initial first few years, we spent arguing with the whole group. So we would all be in the room around the table, and then Lieutenant Colonel Jenkins would just look at me, and I'd look at him and say, What you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> and it would be on from there. And so our monitoring team, who was put in place by the federal court, would say, Okay, we need, y'all got to come together. You guys have got to do this work so we can get it. There are five years of federal oversight. We got an additional year because we proved that the city and the police were dragging its feet on doing problem solving. And we'll talk about that. So, now how do I make it go? Oh, I just hit the next thing. Oh, I, I, need, so. a, I need a clicker. I need to be Vanna Black for real. <laughs> <laughs> she will use your arrows also. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Nice. This is the presentation that Alan and I did in Minneapolis. So, some people can get some thought of what it is that we did here in the city people most don't ask or really want to ask is how did black people get the righteous entry conditions as soon as police? Because we had to agree to do it. And then we had to agree not to just take money for the families that were inside of the collaborative because we settled 14 lawsuits. So not only are we looking to change policy procedures and that, but all of those cases that have been just dangling out there, people's families have no closure. Typically, what would happen the police department would say, Oh, it's justified to move on. We'll give you $500 to bury them. $200, something like that. This we wanted a significant reward for the family. So that was the largest at that time, it was $4.5 million for those 16 cases. Plus, we were just starting to work on, on the policy and procedures and guidelines. Because remember, we have two agreements, guys. Nobody else in the country has what we have. We have the cookie cutter DOJ agreement with the city, and then we have the collaborative that has a class set. It. This is all African Americans and our black people who are perceived as such, who live and walk on the streets of Veracruz, the city of Cincinnati, who come into contact with the police and or their agents. And then the last one says others. Not that we wanted to be on top of that particular box, because we must be mad. The people that the police keep. And arrest and arrest and detain. Who wants to be that group of people? And then who wants to be the person that has to fight for 20 years to ensure that the, the policies and procedures mess the guidelines? But that's something else because I can't help it. My ancestors told me to do it and I was born on the front line, so I think I like it. This is our <laughs> local police. <laughs> this is our local police. Overview. It just gives you the construct of what our city looks like, who, who runs what and who's first. But all of these people help the Cincinnati Police Department. And this is critical, especially as we're talking the time of guns now. Okay? Somebody got to tell me where they're coming from. But we are in an open carry state, man, and CCW since I don't know, you know, what's an illegal gun, but we'll talk about that some other time too. That just gives you, you know, how our city runs with the, the, the mayor, the city manager, the voters, of which I am, which makes me the boss. I keep telling how we fight about this slide because the voters need to be on top because we're the boss and we need to teach them. They work for you. They work for us. They need to hear us, right? And then this, this thing, that union needs to get way down here. You represent inside, not outside. We have to figure out how to kind of get into these unions. Let's put our heads together, right? Figure that out. All right, so we had our federal court order. We went into federal court. But before we did that, 
the Cincinnati blanket on the front end, our friends, those who like this, uh, knew that the city was dragging its feet on the thing. So we being the history buffs that we were, Reverend Lynch was our president. If anybody knows Reverend Dan Lynch, the third you know, the something I reckon with, right? And we just thought that if they don't hurry up and catch up, we're going to do some of this. And so as we were trying to negotiate through this process, we had to enact well, the sanctions and the boycott on traveling to the city, right? The city didn't like that. The city lost a lot of money. So that same jazz festival that those 14 restaurants closed their doors, well, guess what? We shut it down for the viewers. But if anybody in this room besides him, because he did a little research, can tell me who the first international star was, national star that said they were not going to come to Cincinnati and honor our boy kind of a guy. <laughs> did you move it to a different city or did you just uh, city of Cincinnati go on? No. Did you get uh, the music festival you said was shut down? It didn't go anywhere. So you that there wasn't one at all? Okay. Yeah. Who was the first national star? Stevie Wonder. No. That's a good one though. <laughs> That's a good one. You ready? Ten seconds. You're gonna Ten say dollars. it, I'm gonna go. Drake. <laughs> Drake. Drake wasn't even born. <laughs> <laughs> he was still in Walt Disney World. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is this thing doing? Do you have your power cord with you? That's probably why it's doing that. Okay. Anybody? Can anybody guess? I can't make it up. Right. Nobody said no plugs. Nobody said. See, so you didn't yeah. tell you. See, this. Yeah. 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 It was Bill Cosby. Okay, so there's a reason why nobody guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all biting our tongue. It was Bill Cosby, and it was, it was, we were at a time where on the internet was not friendly to black folk. That's when cell phones, you say, call me after nine. Mm -hmm. I just said it because she planned it. And we were in the middle of a whole lot of nonsense saying, girl, put that phone down. We've known the phone all day, <laughs> you know, because you had to communicate that way. Bill Cosby, Prince, Mary J. Blonde's Baptist National Convention took a million dollar hit for us and did not come to the city. So those things, I think it was the world of clergy, the president came to Cincinnati. That's a name that you all recognize, the world of clergy. He came to Cincinnati to meet with us. He was from Europe and he came. Tell us about what you're going through. And we did. There were so many speakers that said we would pull out. But we were old school, so we had to handwrite letters. It wasn't about email then. The digital divide was great. So, I don't know how I got there, but I'm going to keep moving on. And just take it. I suspect it, and this is what old oh, you're a <laughs> So, our lawsuit contains of two components. You got the DOJ agreement, and then you have the collaborative. Both of them are like this. You know why? We have one of the smartest attorneys in the country. I told you all at the conference page. He was able to sit in the room and not just hear the community. I'll be able to hear the city employees who wrote the deeds. Who wrote the CI? What role did you play? And that, I was project manager for the Cincinnati Black United Front. So it was my job to design how we would collect stories from the Black community. And that was in the winter of 2001. Do you all look like my young man? <laughs> <laughs> Now, <laughs> I don't know, rain, no cold water, I don't want any of it. And so it was my job to design how we would collect stories because that's one of the things that you have to do. We also had a very unique um, opportunity with Judge Susan Delott, who was in the Sixth Circuit Federal Court. And she said, let's open it up to a class action. Bring it all to me because there were pieces inside of the federal courthouse, multiple. 
And so it was our job to go out and get a lens of what was happening in the community. So we collected over 400 stories. And we had to almost do it in secret because people were afraid of retaliation. And they didn't want to come out the media. So we had to tell the media, you can only get people's feet. You cannot show their faces. People were afraid. But it was the most humbling time. You know why? Because no one had ever asked the black community how its police was treated. And no one had ever asked, how do you want to be treated? Yes, sir. Do I not remember at some point there were more like 3,500 testimonies? I'm going to get there. Oh, okay, sorry. See, this is what happens when you want to be a teacher's pet. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. I'm going to chronological order, man. Uh oh, it's acting, it's acting up. Um, so we collected over 400 stories. Yeah. Can you see it? I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's waiting on Jesse like I do all the time. <laughs> um, so we collected those 400 stories. I can, I can talk about it. And we gave those to our attorneys. And who had um, constructed the questions? We didn't. Because this, these stories were going to be part of the lawsuit. So 400 people came, 400 of people who look like grandmothers and grandfathers and boyfriends and girlfriends and friends and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and cousins and friends and young folk came to tell stories. There was a guy who came who had a story from 1969 and I think he came down to New Prospect. My husband Jesse ran that site. We had five different sites over the city, throughout the city, believe it or not, the Cincinnati Recreation Department worked with us. They worked with us, opened this to us, and said, you can use our facilities. Um, and the only agreement was that nobody's faces would be shown. But he came with documentation. My husband brought it to me and the man. He said, I need to bring him to you. But because the state of Ohio has a two-year statutory, I don't know what you legally call it, but you can only go back two years to prove your case. Statues. Statue of limitations. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And if there's one thing that I regret in doing this work is that we didn't hold on to him because he left and we didn't, we weren't able to get, because somebody needed just to confirm to him that we hear you. We acknowledge your pain because he kept every piece of paper, every doctor deal, every complaint that he had filed with him. So, but because we can only go back two years, those 400 stories turned into the 16 that I talked about that were settled inside the collective agreement. Now, look, my teacher's pet is talking about over here. <laughs> <laughs> but as we were moving forward to collect more data from the community, we had to figure out how can we get the entire Cincinnati community to understand and approve what we're doing. Nobody wanted to do anything just for Black people alone. Well, what do we do about other populations of people? We, we, we had to get the okay from the Archbishop, the diocese. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the Archdiocese. We had to get the approval from him to say go forward, believe it or not. All the politics that happened around some things. But we created eight stakeholder groups. So that included the youth, nonprofits, <coughs> for profits, police, and their families. The LGBTQ population. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> African Americans are a separate group. Most of the time, we're included in the whole thing called a minority. I don't know where minorities are from, <laughs> but we're included in that. Um, and then I'm forgetting two others. Y'all inside the document, the CA. But we created eight, eight stakeholder groups to come up with the goals of the group. And we simply ask three questions. Do you feel safe around the police? How do you want the police to treat you? And will you stay engaged? And we spent, each group had its own day. And of course, the youth were our largest group, mostly African American youth. That's where the 3,500 people came together to vote on the goals of the collective group. All 3,500. That is what wrapped its arms around the agreement and gave us the go ahead to do the work. 
is that people understood. We also had this grid, and I wish I had it to show you, not that my computer would work, but each group almost answered the questions the same way. It lets you know how much more in common we have than not. If people are honest and they feel safe in their answers, police and their families, they wanted to go home at night. Black folks want to go home at night. LGBTQ want to go home. <laughs> For profit and nonprofit, if you stop by the police, you just want to go home. You don't want to be harassed. You don't want to be disrespected. You don't want people to be discouraged to see because it's not necessary. If we could dwindle it down and look at the very small, minute of people who do crime and where they do it at, we would do policing better. That's in that's in the PowerPoint. That's the problem solving part of this agreement is to focus on you doing the crime and not everybody else around you. And not taking her and say, because you're sitting, sitting away from him. You just been part of this. You're complicit just simply because you have on some form. Now, typically, it's because you're black. And so I must know that Simone committed a crime because we're black. I should know these things. It's black magic. I had something to do with it. I don't. <laughs> I don't know her. <laughs> and I didn't okay it. <laughs> well, why in the hell are you bothering me? These are the things that problem solving gets you. I know that we're going back and forth and it's getting up to the top of the hour. And I want to make sure if you got any questions. And I'll come back. We can zoom it, we can live it, we can do anything. So if you fast forward, that's 20 years ago, and see, there's so much to talk about. This is not little work. This has been a lot of work. I can't even quantify the hours I've been in meetings. Can I say, well, we try. She's my right A, B, both sides of the brain. She's an engineer. She's smart. I can't even, I can't tell you how many hours I've been in meetings. Trying to get to better. I just want to get to better for black people and police it. And if black people get to better, it's, it's much better for you all because you don't experience what we experience anyway. Plus, it saves tax dollars, saves lives, injuries to citizens and officers. We can quantify what we've done. The 2001 Cincinnati Police Department arrested 35,412. I'm making up the last hundred. <laughs> In 2020, they arrested 11,000. To me, that's a, a win, a reduction by 64%. You know why? Less interaction, <laughs> less opportunity for that interaction to go wrong. And it also means that police are trying to figure out in Cincinnati how to police better. And they need us to help them figure that out until we can figure out how to protect and serve ourselves and figure out how to hold other people responsible. There are a lot of things we call the police for that they have nothing to do with. You look at the calls for service, it's like 54% isn't about police things. So we have nobody else to call. Mm -hmm. yep. And we don't want to call on ourselves. I, my parents or my grandparents never called the police. I don't know what's happened to us. We're giving up our power. We're giving up the control, design, Dealing with our, our people, dealing with people, loving one another, having the opportunity to say it's all right. Who made you speak to say? That's what young people do, right? We've all been young. I know I'm still young. I don't know about him. <laughs> He's old. He's old. He's old. A long time. Yeah. <laughs> so we can quantify that the method and that we put together in the city of Cincinnati works. We can quantify. But we still have to scratch the surface. There's still so much because you have to go through elected officials. We're now on our get ready seventh mayor, seventh police chief, because our police chief will be retiring, a new council. So, how do you institutionalize these things so that they don't go away? That's what we attempted to do by the refresh. Somebody tried to use that as a political. Vote for me, tool. We've been asking for a refresh. 
since 2015, 2012. Dr. Eck and I did a presentation around problem solving in 2012 to say, hey, some things are not working. We need to look at what we put together. And Al and I were so busy focusing on police and the city administration, the community was left to fend for itself, as we often are. Iris really has never had a budget, a staff. Black and Down Front didn't get funded. And out of all of that, Millions of dollars was raised to do some things, but nobody ever said to the group of people that was courageous enough to sue the police and say, here, we gotta make sure that there's money here so that you can follow up, that you can continue to monitor. So when people look at me, I know I make it look easy. It's not, this, this has impacted my family in the worst way. I've lost everything but my business. We had to fight for our son in juvenile court system. They took him away for three years. And while in the court, the judge said, this is not your black and out of front meeting. We don't care anything about collaborative care. I had to call Reverend Lynch and say, please come. I had never, as a mother, been inside a juvenile court. First time I've ever seen a child shackled. Mm -hmm. My child. And once they are adjudicated, they are adjudicated to a whole other system. You are no longer in control. If one more person would have told my husband and I that we were great parents, it was going to be a problem. We couldn't take them. Certainly not by your sense. So all of that is relevant um, to getting this work done. I just have been blessed to be with some courageous people, having a wonderful spouse. Hopefully he makes it. <laughs> so y'all can meet him. And great friends that have helped me through it. And I'm serious, and who cares about this? So in the refresh, we paid Saul Green, who was our monitor for the bulk of the time, is the third <coughs> set that we hired um, to be the monitor. We employed Saul Green and some of his team, and some of his team to come back and evaluate us. So they asked us for all this data. What's the community been doing? What's the police been doing? What's the city? It was hostile in there. Uh, FOP president just was not like me. I don't know why. Hey, we get done. We got. We got to fight it. <laughs> oh boy! Now you're in trouble. Oh boy! <laughs> um. And so inside of the refresh. And I'll make sure that if you have those documents, or I can send them to you. The refresh document? Yeah. No. There are 3.5 reports that came out of the refresh document. And they evaluated us not on the entire collaborative agreement, but on the systematic plan that we developed in 2008 in federal court, along with the manager's advisory group. And that took the most important components of the collaborative and put it in the plan. So these, this is the things that help us. Sorry, 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 sorry. What other tent? Can we turn off the lights? No. no. Joking. <laughs> Another technical difficulty. Just any any technical difficulty. So the three areas, and I'll make sure that I send the reports in for police accountability, mutual accountability of all parties, and then problem solving uses. And inside of those three reports. They're pretty scathing. They're pretty scathing when you read them. And we've not touched the recommendations of them either. Not many. I think we've only done one. And I say we because I take this personally. Wait, when you say we've not touched them, you mean? We've not implemented one. Yeah. Hmm. Not one. And you want to know why you have to ask me. Have the systematic public schools? started a uh, program to instruct the youth in the schools on how to behave when they're stopped by police and what their duties are and their rights and all uh, that. That's right. The main thing it seems to me, the reason it's, it's even happening is to save the lives of those kids that get killed. I don't know what you can do for older people, but for the, at least if the, if the kids know how to act when they're stopped by a policeman and what their rights are and duties, 
um, it could really help because everybody needs to be educated in a situation like this. Yeah. And where's not the police who are trained? Well, let me answer you, but let me answer you. Let me answer you. Let me answer that, please. Police are trained very well and have to interact with adults and children. But it's the kids that run away when the cop when the cop wants to arrest them or stop them and they run. Doesn't mean you kill them. No, I'm not saying that. But if the if the kids knew, if the, if the kids know what their duties and rights are, that goes that that, that really Who's more work. responsible in that interaction, the child or the adult? Think about it before you answer. Just think about it. Who's more? I don't. And, I don't know if you can say one is more responsible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. But I, I think what you're each saying, has its own duties. Each she's has, clear. She's clear. Each has a, each side has its own duties and and rights. And to say one is more important than the other when you have a, an interaction among different people, I, I don't know. If so let me let me answer you like this. When you look at the arrest of white children versus black children is three times as much. Children are children. What do you mean you're Hold on, arrested? the disparity the says that black children are arrested three times as much as white children. In What's the, the difference Cincinnati? in the city of Cincinnati? And I know there's about a 50-50 of, of, of no. population. We're 42% of the population, so we're, we're close, yes. Okay. So that don't, that don't mean you arrest half of the children in Cincinnati, black children. But what it does mean is that the same thing you do for non-black children, you do for black children. Especially when you're trained, you want to be an adult. Okay, let me, let me, it's not, no, it, it, no, it's not. Listen, black children are the only children on this earth that are taught how to act with the police. Why is that? How can you sit there and tell me that I need to teach my children how to act with the police? I have to because they don't value their lives. And I have to tell my children and all the children that I speak to that if you have a negative interaction or an interaction, to please call me, let me handle it. It shouldn't be that way. It can for them. If they learn, if, if they learn. Why would an officer want to kill a child? That's okay. All I'm saying is, if the kids know how to act, if they feel secure, kid, instead of bringing so many of these kids, but that's away, what kids. That's why you call. That's why they're called children. They don't know how to act. Right, but if the school taught them how, maybe a, a larger percentage of them would. So what? What was Jameer Rice doing when he was shot by the police? I'm only discussing Cincinnati. I think it's the duties of the schools to teach all kids, regardless of race, creed, or color, how to act. What their rights and their duties are in the law. So you don't think it's the responsibility of the police to treat children like children and treat them? The schools have the most children? interaction with children they see them every day. And they learn how to be citizens, they learn how to read and write. What do they learn? What do they, they learn, learn how to be citizens from? There's a society. It's a civics lesson. They learn how to act. And they the schools, learn what the but schools don't no even civics. teach civics. No civics in schools, then. There's no civics. Well, that then if I was on the school board, you know yeah. what? There would be. Okay, okay. Jump in that's an important part. If you're a citizen, you have to know what your citizen's duties and rights are. If you are a child, are mm -hmm. you saying that a child should have the same amount of information as an adult? No, I didn't say that. I said they should have an age appropriate um, understanding of uh, what it, what it, of how they're supposed to act. But what if they act well? What if they do exactly what the police says and it still ends up badly? I didn't say. I, I'm not, a question I'm not to advising you. the police department. I'm concerned about the kids that learn because they're scared. Everybody does. Have you not seen cops? <laughs> I don't think everybody does. Oh, yeah. Everybody runs. I think that when some people run, they cower. They, they turn into uh, they turn into they freeze. I know. I know people have been. Some people do do that. Like when people are in war, instead of. Understand how to treat children who might run. I, 
if you want, if you want to have me, if somebody wants to, I think my I, wife, yeah. my no, no, no. Have. I want you. I want us to discuss this, and I want us to to, to figure out what's the best possible solution. The best thing to do for everybody. Is to give my name to somebody on the school board, and I'll come and talk to them about how important it is for my viewpoint. For about how important it is for kids to know what they're, what they're, how they're supposed to. Act. I started out this conversation by saying children see negative interactions with police all day long. You think they don't see it? Well, maybe they should be shown in school some uh, interactions aren't, aren't good. Interactions. They see, it, they see it whether they're in school. Police are in the schools. In Cincinnati, we have what we call SROs, student resource officers. They are there. They actually interact with our children much better than the regular beat officers. So ask me about Regardless. that. If, kid, if, kids Regardless. To, kid, if kids learn how to read and write, they can learn how to act. The problem mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, okay. like white yeah. children okay. and black children could have the exact same knowledge of how to act, and black children would be the ones who would be more likely to have a bad experience. I think that's, that's what it would have done. I don't know if that's true or not. But all I know is, let me give you an example. If, if yeah, see, yeah, I, I don't care about your opinion anymore, Peggy. I want to hear Mr. Rowley. I've had enough of you. I don't even know who you are. You don't. And I don't know who you are, but you've dominated this whole conversation. You know, would, would, you like, would you like to stop talking? And well, let's, let's, let's let the room decide. Do you want to, you want to hear this interaction? No, no, no. All right. Okay. So, inside of the refresh, the three things that were most important in the CA plan police accountability, mutual accountability, and problem solving. Problem solving gets you to the solution that we're talking about today. That not all children are bad children, not all adults are bad adults. Some people suffer from some mental health issues. There are other things that come into play. So that policing is done in a very surgical, data-driven way. And not just a way that blames everybody in a group of people. It doesn't do that. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. What I have done uh, over the last couple of years is that I've gone out and found some young people who were organizing, doing the Brianna Tank on her birthday. And I went out you know, during the pandemic and I said, hey, because Cincinnati has a different path. We're not Louisville, Kentucky. We actually changed our chunk hold policies the same year that Roger Owens Jr. was murdered. It is no longer acceptable in the city of Cincinnati. That's been on the books for 20 years. So we changed that plan. And so when I introduced them this last year and a half, they've been working very closely with myself, my husband, Miss Simone, Reverend was to learn this process so that they can be at the table the next elevation. Because they have big ideas, big thoughts. They feel a certain way. And a lot of them were arrested last year during the, the protest. So it's not happy about that I'm going to sit that mandate down. Um, so as I said, we have a lot of work to do in those three areas. There are multiple things up under that. We certainly could use your help if you're about this part. If you just like fix some food for us, we'll take that too. <laughs> 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 That's a job. <laughs> or all this data that we need to collect that we are collecting, we can use some each other. And or these kind of types of conversations. It is very, very hard to have these conversations. But we can do it. As I said, we just left Minneapolis. I've been to Puerto Rico to have this conversation uh, about policing. Yes, sir. Since you were just in Minneapolis, uh, and Minneapolis is taking some major steps, uh, but you know we've been, as you as you pointed out, because of the collaborative agreement, we've been ahead of the curve mm -hmm. for a lot of cities, and it has shown significant results. Yes, but there's more to be done. There is more to be done. We have shown significant results by way of lawsuits. At one point, we had a gazillion lawsuits. I think. The last I checked, we were maybe at one or two. That saves taxpayers, right? So if we can actually sit down and figure out policies and procedures and guidelines that save everybody, including officers. Typically, people will get me with, if you're about reform or accountability, you must be against policing. No, I firmly believe that you can have police accountability and police safety always, public safety at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. It's an and, it's a comma, it's a must. So do you have any thoughts about the quote, 
defund the police movement? Um, I do, but I, that the term is just a non -star Yeah, the term, yeah. the term, the term, the term, the term, the, the, the term, and I don't know who created that. Somebody mm -hmm. that knew that it was going to create all of this chaos. But I can see in the city of Cincinnati, we moved some dollars around. Last year, there was a million dollars moved from the police budget to do some of the employment. Uh, we have a citizens complaint authority that just got an additional four hundred thousand dollars because the uptick in complaints and the backlog is happening. Um, so yeah, there's there's ways to get it done to get around the BS and the politics. Yes. I have to do a quick little background for this, but I do. There is a question at the end of this. I <laughs> I, I apologize. That's okay. I uh, I lived in upstate New York. I lived in a small rural town. My boyfriend and I went out for a walk. I had a gun put in my face, and I'm sorry for the slur, everybody. But I was asked if I wanted to be a dead packet. Sounds sad. The first question I was asked from the police after I called 911 was, "What did you do to deserve it?" That was my first question. I want to know, is there a place or is it too ingrained to retrain officers into not victim blaming? Because that's what that is. That's blaming the victim. That's mm -hmm. saying you are a certain type of thing and you must be at fault because you're that thing. Is there an ability to retrain or is that too ingrained in this? I'm going to admit one other thing here. I have family members who are cops, and I am I am absolutely amazed by the inability of training to get through sometimes. It's so properly training, you're asking them to change their brain. Yeah, you're asking them to, to train something. They train out something that they, that is ingrained in their profession. So is it? Are we catching new recruits, or is it retraining old officers? Is there a hope there? That's an amazing question. And sorry for your experience, but that's an amazing question. And that is the pre-work, right? Because I've sat in interviews and I tried to get there. Like, how do I get to that person's heart and heart? And it's difficult. If that person is asking that, it's very difficult. Like a question I ask. Tell me about the people you police before. And so farmers and non-farmers. Okay, you're in the state of Ohio? Yeah. Right. Not too many black farmers in the state of Ohio. I know these things. I keep up with my peeps. Um, so I wasn't convinced that coming to Cincinnati and being placed in an urban setting might not be a good fit for you. May not be. But what I didn't know was what the background check consisted of. Because that is supposed to get to the hearts of the hearts. Over here. See, I don't know what white people are in privilege from. I don't know if it's at home. I don't know if it's school. I don't know if it's the church you go to. I don't know where. All of it. And, and, <laughs> right there. <laughs> and I, I, I can honestly add just a little anecdote to that because I, I, I know a lot of people talked about my shoes when I came in. <laughs> I'm sure somebody saw the little rainbow flag on there, but let me show you something. Okay, this little rainbow flag pops off. I can hide what I am. Oh, I can't, can't hide what I am. And I don't want to. I, I, I understand. And I thank you for saying that. And yeah. I don't want to. Because yeah, I love me. And, and I love me. That's why this is here. If I get in the situation, this comes off. You can't get ashy enough. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? I'm telling you. So, you know, I mean, I, it's I don't, it's amazing. I, I, Thank you for acknowledging yeah. that because now we're seeing uh, upwards to six plus thousand of uh, black children being arrested at the hands of the police. And the triggers are coming from multiple sources, right? So when you ask the question about retraining, let me, so it's several things that should go in the investigation into who you are, right? The preliminary, back when you first fill out your application, how you answer your psychological question. And we need to make sure. But psychology matches the time. You can't be a psychologist from 1932 still asking these questions, right? So we need to make sure that that matches the, the times and matches the people. Yeah, being in New York, there's 139 different nationalities. Right? So how do you speak the language of all of these people? First, you got to acknowledge that they're even here. 
So, so then thirdly, in the interview, so what we're doing with Cincinnati Police Department, we have been fortunate enough to populate people inside of these interviews, interviewing sessions, whether they're recruits from outside or labs coming from inside of Ohio, so that we can figure out how to get to the hearts of the hearts. But I'm telling you, it's difficult when it's being masked, um, when hatred is masked. It's short of putting on, what is that thing, lie detector test. Mm. But if you put policies, procedures, and guidelines to, one, prevent, expose, and the discipline, and have the healthy atmosphere to fire early on. Mm -hmm. so one of the things that was wrong with Chauvin and uh, who killed Sam DeVos? Tenzing. Tenzing. Their record showed you who they were. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Their record showed you who they were. Nobody was paying attention. So it wasn't, even though the Minneapolis Police Department, they came out and said, this is not who we are. Yeah, it is, because you allowed it to go. Mm -hmm. Sean had proven who he was a long time ago. So we need good people like yourselves to help us get keep this work going. We need the brain trust of our elders, the historical fact of what has happened so that we don't go back there. We need the young folks' innovation and thoughts because they have great ideas, right? And we still need to be able to talk to people who oppose and who think that the victim is the problem. With that, I'm gonna make sure I send you with everything I have. Uh, I'm gonna see you in the refresh and make sure. Oh, let me say this because I have to. I have to say this. Last year, uh, the young folk that I pulled off the street that was organizing in a grand way, and myself and I, you know, Ohio Justice and Policy Center, we were able to negotiate into the FOP's contract. Okay. We put forth six things. We got three things in. None of this ever happened, but we did it in a proactive way. Changing systems should not occur when people die. People shouldn't have to die. Shouldn't people, people shouldn't have to be told you should know how to act. Slavery is over. It is no longer on the books. You know how to act on your job. You filled out an application. This is not your right. You said you wanted a job, and I paid you for that job. And when you don't act accordingly on that job, you got to go. It's just as simple as that. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how it should be. And, and the part of democracy that my husband and my son participated in is, as he says, this is the greatest work. Um, how did you say Greatest that? act of democracy I've ever lived in. Because regular citizens got tired, fed up, and said there will be no more killing, and if there's someone's going to be held accountable. What we have now is a result of the citizens' complaint authority that is written, that is codified, written into the charter, and it has its own budget, its own executive director, and it is there to represent the people, the plaintiffs, not the defendants. And I was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's been the, our community representative of the Cincinnati Black <coughs> of our organization and the community for the past 20 years. So unlike other cities, they don't have a person in the community that mm -hmm. had that steadfastness. But people got to live, got to work, got kids, you know, it was life. But uh, fortunately for us, she was able to stay on and has never left and around the country and the world. To, to talk about what we have done, what we need to stop, stop and twist in New York. And, and they acknowledge uh, the work you did here, and they acknowledge Irish coming up there to teach them for about two years on the methods and the process in which we use. Three years. And uh, they acknowledge them. So, <laughs> so it worked. And, and the bottom line is when they say you can't sue City Hall, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So City Hall, Cincinnati Police, and the FOP. But the greatest thing about it is, after the suit, we are, we are all, which I can say until today, partners in making the change 20 years later. So that's the difference where the FOP, the Cincinnati Police, and the city all said we have responsibility and we're going to make a commitment to be there. And to their credit, they have that. 
have a band as easy as we want, or kick, brought them kicking and screaming, but better still, they are there and working to this day. That's I can't just say it better. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure if this is something that you're allowed to do as, as a representative of the Black United Front, but we have a mayoral election and a city council election coming up. Do, do, does Black United Front endorse candidates or we have not, but what we did do last year, well, this year, the primary, we had a primary forum. The Young Folks Hub. We asked several questions mm -hmm. and we also sent out a survey. And I can share the responses so you can see the two who made it through the primary. I would be very interested to see that. We will be doing another one and another, probably two or three for city council before the election. Great. So we tend to keep us informed. Yes. Yes. Good question. The material you wanted to send to, send to me, I'm going to suggest you send to fix the secretary here, uh, and then it can be distributed to the group to people who want it. Yeah, well, I it. want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. missed the jokes already. <laughs> I said I like you better than. <laughs> oh, yeah, you do. I can tell you do. You <laughs> just missed the joke. I wanted to add to something for the discussion that happened earlier, 30 years ago, when Scott Greenwood and I were both part of the ACLU in Cincinnati. We produced cards that were handed out to people that told them. What's how to act, you know, when the police what stop. Did you stop? I remember those but, calls. But, but what, I, what I wanted to add is that you shouldn't have to hand out cards like that. You should be able to act like a normal human being having a normal encounter with a normal other human being, not someone who is in charge of you or who gives you orders and where you have to do step and fetch and yes sir, no sir, no sir, yes sir. You shouldn't have to do that. Nobody should have to. Protect and serve. They're supposed to be serving us and protecting us, not, not controlling us in charge of us, etc. So um, I think it has a lot to do. I mean, you Absolutely. said you said they're very well trained. They're very well. They're trained five times more than we in the police department in the state of New York. But nevertheless, they're also trained in certain kinds of paramilitary ways. Uh, they're trained on how to use their weapons. Uh, they yeah. shoot in the middle of the body. Yeah. You know, for some reason, they shoot 50 times sometimes. They you know? sh it's amazing, but if you look at it, and we can study this, how uh, white officers versus black officers shoot, mm -hmm. and when they shoot them. Oh, well. And when they're shooting. And when they're shooting. Yeah. So how, how do they shoot differently? Because we had a black officer shoot a suspect who had a knife, and he could have very easily shot the killer and he didn't. And he probably like the I was interested in, in, in this and that I have uh, two family members who are police officers. One's in England, so he's a Bobby, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other's in Indiana. And have they come to you? with questions for help. For example, you kind of touched on something that I thought was very important, domestic violence and the mentally ill and how they deal with that. And especially from the one here in the States, those are the calls they just absolutely hate. And domestic know. violence calls are the most dangerous for police. And so I was wondering if, you know, from their side, they had any questions, you know, when we began this work, I remember that there was a team um, from London, I want to say, who came and told us about all the stuff we did. I think they were part of our first monitoring team or something that we were evaluating. So we got a lot of history data, right? We were going for stop carrying the guns. Like the Bobby series, they don't have that. They just, they just have the bullet guns. Um, so we were able to study some of their strategies. There's this national organization called Problem Oriented Policing where we all come together and we all look at what each other's strategies are. Who's doing what in policing? What gives you the best results? What does the data say? So we look across the globe to see what kind of strategies we can use and who's utilizing them. And believe it or not, you alluded to this 
William, is that people have looked at our agreement and they have done things and it's actually, I mean, they just have blown us out the water. They've taken parts of it and just done things that we need to catch up with them now, just because we were created to see it. But yes, we do look across the country at what strategies are being used and how can we bring them to the city of Cincinnati. And, you know, the municipalities around us, part of the, the larger issues are the smaller ones that don't have the budgets like the bigger cities that sit in the midst of in, um, where we are. Right? That could cause problems. And the other problem is that could become potentially a bigger problem is that the hospitals are now creating police departments. The university has the UC campus, UC Health, and then one in Mason, which means they have a chief and a force. So now we really have more police in, in our midst that are not under this type of agreement. This agreement is just for the city of Cincinnati. Yeah. A big difference between two family members. Uh, I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine that. Well, a big one is it's not a train. Yeah. My, uh, it's my son in law so, you know. But anyway, <laughs> he's got a college degree and plus several, several months to a year of training just to become a police officer there. It's almost a two-year process to get home. The other thing that we're trying to do in the city of Cincinnati, and we talked about this today, was that in the city we passed in 2018, before this to say we were going to create the public safety high school to populate the police force for the youth who went from 9th to 12th grade being trained. And if they wanted to go, but you have to be 21. So in that two year time period, they can get some type of security training, criminal justice training at the university, but they then populate the force so they can we can get the people from the communities of where they live to serve, right? And we get a different result. But we're still fighting. Peter, have we had any questions on chat? Well, no, I've been I've been monitoring. Okay. Nobody on chat wants to ask me a question. No, I, I should. <laughs> let me give them hell. <laughs> yes. I would like to know if you thought about what your business thought about having police get their own personal insurance. Uh, we believe that is a great idea. Yes. What is the term, the national term that gives them a little? Oh, oh, I know. It's got to go. It's got to go. No, that was the, the reason for uh, Iris being able to propose uh, a change in the. Uh, contract between the, the city and the police. Now you have to understand the city and the police contract, the FOP, is hardly ever changed. There's hardly ever, and when it's changed, nothing is taken away. But in this instance, peer-to-peer -peer review was taken out. Do you remember that one? Peer-to-peer -peer -peer review, meaning that in some of these instances, they never even rose to a supervisor. It's your peers who decide to go for it. You know that? No. No, I, when, when she asked that question, I've, I've been a nurse for 12 years. I, I defy you to find a nurse that doesn't have personal liability insurance, uh, yeah, even if they work in, in a hospital. That's, a, that's an awesome idea. And, and we, we don't talk about it because we know we're the ones that's going to get sued. If we say we have insurance, I mean seriously, we don't ever tell our managers that we have personal insurance because they will blame everything on us. But you know, taxpayers really need to think about that because it's not taxpayers. Why didn't you have your hand up a long time? Oh, I just want to say I'm sorry, Elaine. That's okay. Um, to bounce off what you were saying, William, um, about uh, and what you were saying that you know. Here we don't have stuff like this because a lot of Cincinnati and like New York City is more of a drive type, you know, people, but people are get pulled over a whole lot. And I've been pulled over twice, mm -hmm. not by police. I was pulled over by one some um, acquaintance that uh, she was following me. I wasn't pulled over, but she let me know. And she followed me and looked into the golf manor while I was showing her a condo that, um, Elaine, do you know you have both? Tail lights out, 
and who knows how long I can have. Because you don't drive from behind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on Vine Street, I was somebody honked at me. Told me she says, you got to turn right out. I said, wow, well, it's a good thing that I'm white because if I was black, I would have pulled over. And I know that because I was a teacher at Queensgate. And if you look at Queensgate, it's minimum security. And if you look at why the guys were there, too dark uh, windshield, tail light out. It was, I mean, definitely. It was def I mean, that's where it starts, driving all black. Yeah, in this city. Absolutely. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad that you did. It's that like, you, Let's you want to know about white privilege. That's white privilege. Yeah. That I was never pulled over. And I was pulled under. They pulled me over for you. <laughs> 